Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Recent grand corruption scandals in Latin America have provided ample evidence of corruption's negative impact on the enjoyment and exercise of human rights. We've seen corruption's corrosive effects in defective dialysis treatment and earthquake-prone infrastructure. We see it in the assassination of community leaders who oppose illegal logging or bribe-fueled dam projects. And we see it in the impunity that shields the powerful from accountability. When officials put personal gain before the public good, the rights to health, housing, education, justice, and even life itself are imperiled. Nonetheless, until recently, international law and legal instruments treated corruption and human rights as largely separate concerns. That is beginning to change as human rights bodies in the inter-American system and at the United Nations start to probe the connections between corruption and human rights violations. Today's discussion aims to deepen the analysis of the nexus between grand corruption and human rights abuses and to look specifically at how international law and institutions should evolve in response. Should human rights and, in, and international criminal law bodies incorporate a, fo a focus on grand corruption? And if so, how? And should anti-corruption bodies incorporate a human rights perspective? And how might these mechanisms collaborate more effectively? Our discussion today features a terrific panel of experts. Jose Ugas, former board chair of Transparency International. Naomi wrote Ariasa, the distinguished professor at U.S. Hastings College of Law. Welcome to the American Dialogue. Uh, Claudio Nash Rojas, professor of international human rights at the Universidad de Chile. Welcome, Claudio. And John Michael Simon, the director for Latin America at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law in Germany. Welcome. The panel discussion will be moderated by Katia Salazar, who is the executive director of the Due Process of Law Foundation. And the dialogue is very, very happy and excited to collaborate again uh, with her and her fantastic organization. And also by uh, Michael Camilleri, who brilliantly directs the dialogue's Peter D. Bell Rule of Law program. Before welcoming the panelists for our discussion, we're delighted to begin today's session with a keynote address by a very good friend and a member of the dialogue, who's now on leave because he has other things to do, uh, Hernan Larraín, who is the Minister of Justice and Human Rights, Chile. Minister Larraín has a long and distinguished record of public service, and during his time in the Chilean Senate, he was a champion of transparency and anti-corruption measures both within Chile and beyond its borders. Among other contributions, he was involved in the creation of the Open Government Partnership and also participated in an expert consultation on anti-corruption convened by the Dialogue and other partners in advance of this past Summer of the Americas in Lima, Peru. So there is really no one better placed to speak on the linkages between corruption and human rights, and between domestic and international law and institutions than Minister Larraín. The minister will deliver remarks, opening remarks, and has generously agreed to take a few questions at the end of his presentation, after which we'll move to the panel discussions. All the speakers today will speak in English, but we do have interpretation available uh, for those who need it. Uh, Minister Larraín, welcome to your house. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael. Let us start anyway. The idea of this presentation is in order to make you more clear my remarks. And certainly, uh, oh, there you are. There you are. And certainly trying to help in a very 
interesting subject, uh, appealing to my experience uh, in Chile as a senator that I was for long term, and also the knowledge that I could uh, gather during these years in the international level. We did work a lot with international organizations as OGP, as Parlamericas, and others, and I think we learned things that probably can help uh, to understand this issue, which is seen from a different standpoint. My approximation came from the transparency and integrity side, rather than from the uh, corruption and human rights approach, which is the one we're looking forward to it. And uh, I have to admit that it is a most challenging way of approaching the subject, which gives a more coherent uh, approximation to this uh, issue. Of human rights. Impunity fosters and perpetuates acts of corruption. Therefore, the establishing of effective mechanisms to eradicate corruption is an urgent obligation in order to achieve effective access to an independent and impartial justice and guarantee human rights. So, this has been uh, revealed to us. But I wonder if something else has been done other than make a disclosure of the problem. My uh, feeling is that we don't have today healthy institutions that can create and promote the conditions for the respect and protection of human rights according to the level of the problem we are facing. And the reason why is that because human rights are very vulnerable. And when corruption scales the way it has been scaling in the last times, in the last years, when you uh, finally achieve success in bribing officials, what you're doing is undermining the rule of law of a country. What you're doing is, if you want to close this vicious circle, you need not only to bribe someone, you need at the end to make sure that this won't have further consequences, which means let us go to the courts. And when you get the courts, when you write charges, then the, the, the circle is complete. And there's very little else to do. And the country is very um, difficult to get away of what is already happening when the whole system is under uh, the bribe of uh, economic interest, of selfish interest. My guess is that this is what's going on uh, due to this large scale of corruption, and we don't uh, have the elements to combat it properly. On the other hand, if we look at it from a human rights position, what we can achieve is having a different and a better approach to tackle with corruption. In a way, this is because corruption, uh, if it's seen as a human right problem, it will receive a higher priority. Who is more sensible when the human rights, the fundamental rights, are in danger. Uh, this will make them more aware and will force them to move to make accountable the people of what's going on. It will also uh, mean that the struggle against corruption is not only a moral duty, but a legal one, which means having uh, rights, enforceable rights. And finally, this will be the proper uh, soil for having uh, regional efforts to deal with the subject in a more proper way. The way that I think this should be faced has two uh, 
ways, two approaches. A national or domestic front and uh, a regional one, which I will develop now. I must start in the national front by stating that there is a basic uh, triangle There is a basic triangle that one must uh, have in mind. There are three elements that constitute a solid and proper state. Church, when a state has democracy, has the rule of law, and has respect and guarantees human rights. Whenever one of these elements falls down, then the whole system is at risk. So we start stating that uh, the promotion of democracy and the reinforcement of um, the rule of law are key to the understanding and self-support of human rights. Otherwise, the system will fail. If we have this element, then we can develop a special strategy in a domestic level so as to tackle with corruption. There are four elements that I think, in our experience, in Chilean experience, are necessary for this purpose. Three in a public level, and one in a private level. I used to think mainly in the three first, in the public ones. And in Lima, uh, which I was invited to in October recently, an OECD in conference, I just stressed these three factors, not the fourth one which I think is absolutely necessary. The three ones are transparency, anti-corruption, legal battle, integrity. But the fourth one is the involvement of the private sector in all these affairs. If we don't get these four elements, I don't think we will succeed. What do I mean with the first one, transparency, the right of access. This has been in our experience and the, in the experience that I know of in many countries, the most relevant and successful kickoff for fighting and stressing human rights and particularly uh, integrity and uh, honesty in civil servants and in the public sphere. We need to develop, at the constitutional level, the right of access. It has been, it needs to be recognized in such a level, particularly in countries like ours, in Latin America, that are very close to the legal framework. Our legal culture makes a difference when something is within the law than when it's not. But when it's in the Constitution, then we are at the top level, particularly when the development of constitutional law are today in the more direct and practical enforcement, which makes also a tremendous difference. Not only we need, obviously, a constitutional recognition, we also need a legal framework for the enforcement, for a practical enforcement. We have done it already. We have a law, a bill, that has 10 years this year, and it has been tremendously successful. There's one difference. Many countries have a law like the one we have. What they don't have is the way this is enforced. Initially, in the first law we had in this area, the enforcement was given to the courts, but it didn't work. So we had to change it, and uh, the law, 2008, created an independent organization, the Consejo para la Transparencia, a Council for Transparency, which is an independent body in charge of making this feasible. If you go to the court, you need to go to a lawyer. 
if you go to a lawyer, that's expensive, and proceedings will be very long. The, the way we have developed the Consejo para la Transparencia in these 10 years has ensured that the rights from any people doing right, direct access through internet, even young people, even school kids, in order to make their rights uh, known and uh, apply, has been a total difference. In Mexico, they have a, an institution that has been very uh, successful, but I know no many other examples that can teach that this is the way of developing this area. At the same time, uh, we have developed independent state accountability through different uh, experiences. And finally, we have uh, sort of related what's the protection of personal data to the right of access to public information. This is something important. Unfortunately, it's a very specific subject, but I need to mention it because it's the, the other way that has to be uh, recognized in order to also protect uh, individual rights when they have to face this issue. The second area is a new body of anti-corruption legislation. Transparency, right of access, and a real body of anti-corruption legislation. We have developed in many of our countries weak laws to attend bribery. We recently developed, following OECD standards, a new bill that has recently been published in Chile, which create new crimes for, for uh, people that is involved in corruption, which involves even private actions or uh, private institutions, which even though they do not uh, act with public officials, they can also be uh, committing a crime related to corruption. This is something very uh, relevant. Corruption is not only between our private and a public person. It can also be done among particular individuals, or business in itself, and we need to combat it as well. We need to increase penalties. We have hired them up because they were really shameful. Somebody was uh, condemned by corruption, and he was not even had a slap in his face, nothing whatsoever. So it was a shame on our law. Penalties are now very strong, very disruptive. And additionally to that, if this crime is committed by the higher officials, at the, at authorities, elected authorities, then we have ensured that they will receive effective punishment that they will be in prison. In Chile, we say that you can put in jail somebody that uh, steals a chicken, but not if he commits these big crimes of corruption. We need to change that. It is a shame. This has to be done with effective punishment to those high officials that commit different acts of corruption. And Finally, we have included in these uh, procedures the leniency system, which is the best way to ensure that uh, you can find out what's going on. This, again, is a very interesting fact. Our culture, our legal culture, is different from the common law countries that are more practical, more pragmatic that they can deal in order to get information that one that might help to solve the case. We're more pure, we cannot deal with this, so it, it took a lot of time to make these institutions uh, part of our legal system. We've done it in the trust system. And that has been the, the way to really discover collusion in most different fields. We've included them now in the corruption law in order to ensure that this can be really investigated and therefore sanctioned. The third area is integrity. This is more difficult to do, but almost 
as necessary as the other, fighting nepotism. We cannot keep on naming familiars or even for different, for different ways, making this uh, use of authority to serve or help uh, relatives. This has to be changed. We also need to stop the revolving door system. You work in a, in a field of government and then you are hired when you, are, when you finish your work in, in a business that's been regulated by you when you were authority. There are many revolving doors that have to be stopped. We also uh, require the real assets and interest declaration so that when one is in charge, everybody knows which are your interests, which are your assets, and whatever you are to your decisions, this has to be transparent. We had it a law, but it was really uh, unreliable. We made strong changes, and we have over 60,000 people that have to develop this assets and interest declaration, and the majority of them are all uh, public, open, transparent. So this also helps for integrity. Open, public, and competitive bidding procedures. I've always thought that the reason why Odebrecht didn't come into Chile it's not due to the sanctity of Chileans, but that we have bidding procedures, open, public, and transparent. So the minister or the president was not the one who decided who was the one to be in charge of some uh, building, construction, or whatever. It was an open, public, and uh, transparent thing that helps to avoid people like that. And finally, some ethic regulations. We need to ensure ethic regulations in the public uh, sphere, in public uh, services, and mainly in the political system. We need to make transparent the way political parties and campaigns are financed. We need to know uh, how much money they are spending. We need to know how much they should be spending and put uh, a maximum so as to avoid extreme differences between different candidates. Which means, in other words, let us real regulate the financement of political campaigns. This is very unpopular. Nobody wants to give a cent, a public cent, to any uh, political party or to any politician. But at the same time, it's absolutely necessary. And then, uh, sorry, I, but this is the anti-corruption legislation. This is the integrity and best practices, and now uh, advancing transparency in the private sector. We need to enhance a new culture within the public sector. This is real something necessary. Particularly the, the corporations and the unions of uh, businessmen in different areas. We need to make them more transparent in all sorts of ways. And this is probably, probably difficult. Private businesses say that require their uh, figures and their activities within uh, reserve. That's the only way they can really develop their activities. But the country needs to know who they are, uh, what kind of lobby they do, who is supporting them, and so on. We need to improve, by the way, the regulation of lobby, to empower antitrust legislation. Here, the leniency system is proven to be quite effective. And to develop their own watchdog system. We need to have ethical uh, legislation done by the same businessmen and applied by them. But they have to have this self-regulation. Otherwise, we won't be able to ensure different uh, practices, different behaviors under one meaning. This is in the national front, three and one. The regulation of access to information, integrity, anti-corruption, and the involvement of the private sector. In the regional front, we face a different uh, problem. Uh, basically, 
because the regional challenge is uh, showing us that with even these recent uh, ideas that I was explaining are not enough because of the scale of the regional threat. So we have to do different things. We have to understand that corruption is the trans transnational problem and that the way to face it requires transnational solutions, which we do not have them in the way we need. Again, this is not something entirely new. We do have today the Inter American Convention Against Corruption. It goes too fast. Too fast. Sorry. We have, as I was mentioning, the resolution of the Human Rights, the Inter American Human Rights Commission. We have uh, different um, resolutions in the recent time. And uh, we have the um, decision of this one saying that under the Inter-American legal framework, states have the duty to adopt legislative, administrative, and other measures to guarantee the exercise of human rights against the violations and restrictions caused by the phenomenon of corruption. We do agree on that. And this is what we have to do in the national level. The question is, if, is this enough? And the answer is, in my opinion, it's not enough. <coughs> the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption also says that we need to foster uh, exchanges of experiences you know, to, to see how we are doing with it. But my opinion, and the experience that I've been looking in this last year is that we don't have today nor the rules, nor the, the bodies, not the standards that might help us to ensure that in the regional level we're really fighting correctly corruption in that scale. We are not protecting human rights uh, because of the way we are developing this battle in the international level. I think we have more advancements in the national front, in the areas that I was mentioning recently, but not uh, with the same strength in the international level. The national law is in them, and I think there's more than something that we uh, have to do. I'm trying to be shorter, I don't want to uh, take you too much time. We know that states have this duty. We know that the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption uh, mentioned that we have to promote and facilitate international cooperation in fighting corruption and so on. But I don't think we are being successful in that. The Inter-American uh, Convention Against Corruption has uh, periodical reports in, what, in the way countries uh, fulfill their obligations. I was a senator during 24 years. I never received one copy of what uh, OAS committee and this was doing. I never read in a newspaper comments on this. There was never an issue of what uh, they do. And they did the job. They did the work. They were there. And probably they had some very good recommendations. But nobody followed them. Nobody read them. It was not an issue. So what we're doing is not good enough. We have a problem. We have been challenged by large-scale corruption, by grand corruption. We have tried to defend ourselves nationally, but that is not enough. We need a regional solution. As I would say, we need a regional watchdog. We need to do something different. And this is my invitation. It's not difficult, it's, it's not easy to, to say which are the features of this figure. Michael was mentioning 
some of them in his uh, words, his initial words, I would say that it must necessarily be subsidiarity, follow the principle of subsidiarity, in the sense that regional uh, organizations cannot substitute, cannot replace what each state must do. Therefore, it must also be complementary. It has to be done in both levels. You cannot be thinking only in uh, what has been, been done in, internally. But from the regional side, you have to assist states to be sure that what they are doing is the correct way of tackling the issue. It shouldn't have a judicial character. This is very, uh, very difficult to decide. I admit that there must be a discussion. But I rather feel that this shouldn't have a judicial or quasi-judicial quasi nature in order to ensure a more political, in an ample uh, way of saying it, way of uh, addressing to this uh, nature because of its technical characteristics. It has necessarily been connected to the OAS. We need to work within this framework. When we've done some experiences out of OAS, they haven't worked. Not to mention UNASUR. Uh, as a modest and recent example. We need to have the system work. And if it doesn't work, let us reinforce it, let us change it but within the system. And finally, we have to ensure that this is something done in a very coordinated way. My experience is that there are efforts done by very many people. Uh, institutional think tanks, international institutions like uh, IDB, uh, UNPD, uh, the World Bank, they promote this, isolated in their different ways. OECD in Europe is doing the same job. And they have very interesting and good standards. They were exposed in this uh, Lima meeting. But nobody coordinates. We need a regional watchdog that might coordinate different efforts, might address the line that one has to follow. And therefore, we, we can make sure that our experience will be different than the one it is today. So uh, we have to ensure that uh, what's been done at the international level is not replacing national jurisdiction. We have to strengthen our courts, our rule of law, our justices, and we, we cannot replace them. And unfortunately, the success of this experience will depend on the commitment of each state. But how, how unfortunate this might be, there's no way of replacing what states have to do. So that is the most important and relevant uh, thing that this regional institution has to do is to try to work with the states what they ought to do in this national level with a uh, framework of ideas as the one I was also with four basic structural uh, definitions but also working in coordination with what this regional uh, entity coordinating efforts, helping states might do in order to ensure the rule of law, domestic jurisdiction, and democracy. In few words, the adoption of a human rights approach against corruption has multiple advantages. An effective human rights strategy against corruption requires to work both in a national level, but also in a regional level. What you have to do promoting nationally <laughs> as these four areas, transparency as a right, and with all what that does implies, a real anti-corruption uh, legislation, integrity as not only a new 
group of law, but also promoting self-regulation and the commitment and involvement of the private sector. And with, within the regional uh, level, we need to encourage states to implement new uh, organisms, new standards to achieve a, a proper uh, answer, and particularly to design a regional institution, a regional watchdog that might ensure that what we're speaking about can be compliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lalayin. I think we have the members of the watchdogs right here in this room uh, this afternoon, so uh, I'm sure we'll have some volunteers uh, to join the group. Um, we should have one or two questions, and then because we have so much expertise, and we're going to have a then go to the discussion. But let me just, if I can, start and then go to Jim to Michael. Um, you know, you're you're a, a legal expert, you're uh, an advocate, champion for transparency, anti-corruption, but you're also a politician and in politics for many years. And I was wondering if you could just comment uh, on this regional question. You see what's happening. Uh, from your vantage point in other countries. You know which governments are being elected, which are coming in, which are leaving. You know what business groups are thinking. You know what civil society is doing and the strength and capacity that they have to really affect change. I mean, where, where is the tendency? Are we kind of one step you know, ahead and then two steps back? Is this going in the wrong direction? Do you see a momentum that's being sustained in a positive direction or world? You just, Give us your kind of perspective on sort of the, the politics. Ultimately, it's a political question. You said you can't substitute states, but states just get there through the political process. So, where do you see things going? Well, I, I would say that uh, in, in the region, we've been uh, enjoying a democratic period after a strong later period in the 80s and 90s. 70s, 80s, 90s, 90s, change. So in that sense, we can say that there is a sort of uh, more normal period in, in the region. But that doesn't mean and has not meant uh, a real transformation or a real appreciation of this uh, democracy. Because I would say that there's still a lot of work to be to be done within the political sphere. Uh, so I, I really appreciate your question. I also, as I, as I was telling you, uh, a senator for many years. And I, I believe that we have not worked enough with the politicians. Uh, we work more with the government. I was invited to the OGP when it still wasn't founded. And I said, you're doing a very good job. I think that it's going to be very successful. But I wouldn't think that if you consider working only in the government, you would succeed. So I recommended instead of open government partnership, to an open state partnership. We need to include politicians. We need to include judges and regional authorities as well, local, municipalities, etc. We need to include all the people, but particularly politicians. Politicians last for long in, in their activities. Members of government not only last for long. Many people go on, are ministers, but then they go back to their uh, other activities that they had before. Politicians are sometimes members of the cabinet, members of the parliament, they and political parties. And I would say that we have not been concerned about educating, teaching, promoting, promoting the real best practices one needs in the political sphere. I think, I, I wouldn't say that we are in a better or in a worse moment. I think we have upheavals. But there is the right time because everybody today 
is fighting for democracy. Everybody will say we are for uh, the rule of law. My experience. I promoted lots of uh, changes within the, the legal framework regarding transparency and integrity. No one ever said to me, or to the initiative I, I was promoting, no, in the Congress. But once we had the law, the enforcement of the law was a little bit different. What we had to do in the Congress, take time decisions, in order that we were more open, according to the law we had uh, enacted, then we had difficulties in the enforcement of this law. And this is not a question of rights or lefts. It is a question of commitment, of culture. So if, 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 you, if I understand what you're trying to say, I, I would say let us work with politicians. Sometimes politicians are in the government, sometimes they are in the opposition. Wherever they are, we need to have some basic standards of what they should be doing. That's why I always emphasize, we don't have to rely only in the legal aspect. Let us say uh, integrity law or a, a transparency bill or constitutional amendment. We need to work in the culture. We need to work in behavioral codes. We need to work in, in these other areas in order to ensure that the standards, the natural standards demanded to people that work or develop jobs as authority are according to the standards one needs of them. I would say that here we have a uh, lot to do. Thank you. We'll have one final question and then we'll turn to the uh, Jim. Jim Michael? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very, very impressive and interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I just wonder, rather than think only in terms of a new regional organization, uh, there are examples where countries in the hemisphere have used existing review mechanisms for anti-corruption and for human rights to report on their efforts to build a culture of integrity in the national institutions and to build a culture of transparency. I know that, that uh, Peru, several years ago, reported uh, to Masisi, uh, the Inter-American Convention, on their efforts to build a, a culture of integrity within their Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. I know that Mexico recently reported the efforts to build integrity in the women's justice centers in the review by the UN of the Mexico's performance under the Convention Against Discrimination Against Women. And I wonder what you think about putting corruption and transparency into the mainstream of existing regional mechanisms and not treating it as a separate issue. Well, uh, I would say that's uh, the core of the question. Yeah. Those are isolated examples. I know, I know, I know, I know. But it could be made. As I, as, I, as I was telling, one can think of, let us do this through a uh, judicial uh, institution that regionally might tackle with it. I wouldn't take that, that trend. Let us try with uh, existing uh, regional organisms. Institution. I think that uh, they had the chance. They did have the chance that they didn't work. And I wonder if just uh, renewing them is going to be the way of uh, ensuring success. My belief, and it's a belief, I would say that let us join experiences, let us join efforts, let us transform probably Messesic. Because in yes. my experience, it would, yeah. it would have failed. Had Mississippi succeeded, probably we wouldn't be speaking. But it didn't. So if we want to keep on working with Mississippi, trying to renew it, I don't think we will do, uh, a diff we will get a different result. No? You know that famous set of 
uh, senses of Einstein. Huh? Keep on doing the same thing, and you keep on getting the same results. Well, uh, I would say that we have to do something different. And it has to be regionally. And it has to be, and it has to have the nature of a watchdog. And it has to have the moral authority granted by the state in order to help them. I would say that probably this is a very basic condition. Uh, I think that, for instance, the Inter Inter American Commission of Human Rights has lots of work to do. But the best way of doing that, I was recent, I, I, I'm having a meeting tomorrow with them, is to join efforts with the state, particularly with the state that are willing to fulfill with the human rights standards in the, in the region. Uh, if there's a country uh, that does not uh, apply uh, human rights standards in the country, that has uh, its democracy uh, just in a formal way, but it's not real democracy, a real democracy as such, it's very difficult to work with that state. But if you have states that are really committed to this, and it was interesting, the summit that, was, that took place in, in Lima in March this year was a very good sign that there is interest. But the follow-up of that summit has been of meetings, of meetings, and there will be more meetings. <laughs> we don't have a regional watchdog in charge. It's always difficult to create new institutions, but I would say that the scale of corruption is threatening human rights more than any other thing today. Because we're buying, only they are buying, judges, police, everything. So when that happens, everything is uh, destroyed. I mean, when a country is built by corruption, then you don't have a, a getaway. It's very difficult. You have to renew it, and you have to make a strong decision nationally, but with international support, with international assistance, with international education. I would say, uh, I know, very difficult to decide. But my guess is that uh, with a, a regional watchdog institution crossover with more authority, we can do more than trying to remove the current existing policy. Uh, I promise this will be final very question, but she Kathy is uh, paying for the quick question. Uh, really, I mean, one minute. About the regional what, uh, watchdog, Mr. Uh, Larry, what are you thinking? I mean, what examples are you thinking? What do you think about, for example, a uh, reportership at the OAS on corruption and human rights, or a reportership within the Inter American Commission of Human Rights to focus on this topic? <coughs> well, I I, uh, I haven't gone that far as to thinking in a particular way of making the institution. What I think that it has to be a decision within the OAS, uh, certainly related with the Inter-American System of Human Rights, Commission and Court. But probably uh, further than that, we have to uh, gather the experience of Pesasik. As I learned, there are some good experiences. But we have to do something different. We have to uh, commit not only uh, states, probably we have to also incorporate in such a body the private sector. We have to try to see the way private sector has their own uh, international, not international, uh, national organizations, gremios, uh, different kind of uh, corporaciones. In Chile, we have the Confederación de la Producción y el Comercio, which uh, makes all of the businesses together, agriculture, building, uh, minery, uh, etc., and so on. They have, we have them in one. If you speak to those bodies, they acknowledge the problem, and they want to work on it. 
I've been recently speaking to them because of the new anti-corruption bill we enacted uh, a few days ago. They're terrified. But they say, what can I do? They want to help. I, I think there is a different attitude. So if, if you link uh, existing bodies and new actors as the private sector organized, I think we can create something different. Like to the, the both both things. The the follow up and also the assistance, which is what uh, probably is needed. And that should have uh, from time to time uh, not only interchange of experiences but information of what has been done. And at the same time uh, what is for, for instance, in the Odebrecht case, we are having, in Peru, for instance, some uh, decisions taken related to what happened there, in Brazil and in different countries. There's no regional consequences of what Odebrecht did to our region. This should also be taken in consideration. Probably this should be a decision not taken by this uh, regional watchdog that it can be suggested to the OAS in order to have regional decisions taken by a proper institution to have some other strong consequences to those who dare do and repeat what other did to our region. I want to invite um, the next panel up uh, for discussion, but before doing so, please join me again in thanking Minister Larraín for his excellent <laughs> remarks. everyone. Uh, welcome to the second portion of our discussion uh, on human rights, grand corruption, and the role of international law and institutions. Uh, I'm Michael Camilleri. I direct the Dialogues uh, Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program. I just want to extend my thanks to the minister. We had a wonderful conversation in the office in Santiago last week. It's great to have you here. Thank you for bringing some of the Santiago sunshine with you, uh, at least for a day. Um, I think um, what we've heard from you is, is a really powerful argument for um, efforts to combat uh, corruption and human rights violations and integrating the two. Um, an argument for the need um, for international institutions and international law to play a role uh, in, in this effort and really a charge for all of us to think hard about the, uh, the need for a, a watchdog, we you put it, with, um, with teeth and one that can coordinate and really bring together um, the efforts that, that currently exist. So, uh, thank you for setting the scene for us. We uh, now have a, a really wonderful uh, panel of experts uh, who I'm sure will be an enlightening discussion uh, on, on really at the cutting edge uh, of those thinking empirically, uh, conceptually, methodologically about the nexus between anti-corruption and combating human rights violations. So, Jean Michel, Jose Lugas, Naomi, Claudio, thank you for being here. Welcome. Um, we're going to jump straight into the conversation here, um, and I'm going to turn to Pepe Salazar, our, our uh, partner in crime for this discussion, uh, to, to lead us off, and uh, we'll moderate a, a conversation for um, uh, for the next little while, and hopefully have some question time at the end for all of you to uh, to jump back in. So, Kathy, I'll turn to you to, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you all for staying here. After this very interesting presentation of the of Minister Larraín, uh, I was telling Ambassador uh, that this weekend we had a very interesting meeting here in Washington D.C. of experts on the different different fields that made up uh, international law to reflect about the links between uh, grand corruption and human rights and the, and and also to define concrete avenues to realize this connection. So talking about this and jumping into the conversation. Naomi, uh, to start, why has the anti-corruption agenda become relevant in the human rights protection agenda and vice versa? Vice versa? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, neither human rights nor corruption are new, obviously. And so the question is, what is it about this moment that makes people on both sides of that uh, question think about the other? And I think there's a number of things going on. Um, one is, at least in the region, I think there's a frustration with, you know, 
all of these countries that went through transitions to democracy of one sort or another, and yet, 10, 20 years later, uh, the promise of human rights is still not uh, where it should be. And so I think it's sort of looking at what is it that hasn't been working, even though there have been all these measures to try to change the way government works, to try to uh, change the past patterns of human rights violations. Uh, and they run up against this sense that there is uh, a problem with impunity. And then you start looking at, well, gee, where did that come from? Uh, why is there this problem with impunity? And that leads you to thinking about the changes in the kind of corruption that we're seeing uh, in a number of Latin American countries, at least where um, it's not an it's not a sort of marginal phenomenon. There's always been a marginal phenomenon of corruption, but at this point, it's central to the economy and to the state. Um, Sarah Chase, who was here a few weeks ago, talked about it as an operating system, and I think that's that's the change that uh, that we're seeing that is pushing this conversation. Um, that corruption is in the center of how the state operates. It's in the center of how the justice system is uh, taken over and made deliberately dysfunctional. Uh, it's in the center of how goods and services that should be provided by government aren't getting where they need to get because they're being siphoned off by an operating system of corruption. Um, it, it's, you know, sort of the ability to change and to elect your own government in certain parts of the region is uh, challenged by the way uh, corrupt financing works of political parties. Um, and so I think that you start seeing a number of different impacts that people in the human rights movement start uh, saying, wait, you know, this is why we aren't getting as far as we need to get. Um, the right to remedy, so <coughs> in the way of that. Uh, economic and social rights, so we see more and more cases where, you know, dialysis funds, as Michael said, aren't being, uh, getting to dialysis patients. Um, communities that resist projects that come into being through corrupt financing mechanisms. And when the communities push back, that's when you start getting repression. Um, political choice uh, is limited or negated. Um, from an anti-corruption perspective, I think that the, the big change has been a recognition that you can't keep fighting it case by case. And this goes a little bit to what, what you were saying, Mr. That it's not enough to have you know a case here and a case there and a case there. We need to figure out better how to attack this systematically because it's a systematic phenomenon. And that's something that the human rights movement had to grapple with a number of years ago. That if we if we keep prosecuting human rights related crimes case by case by case, we're never going to get anywhere. We have to think about how to look at this as a system. And I think that learning from the human rights and from the international criminal law area uh, is what's now sort of be translated to people working on anti-corruption. Thank you, Naomi. Let's go to Jose. Jose Ugas, you were the procurador for the Fujimori Montesinos cases. The procurador is the lawyer that represents the, 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 the interest of the state. And uh, during your work or in the Procuraduría, uh, you uh, investigated to address cases of corruption, but not just of corruption, you also work on human rights cases. So how was, how did you do this connection between the corruption cases in the Fujimori Montesinos era and the human rights cases? Well, first of all, I I have to say this is, if there is any Uruguayan citizen here, I want to thank you on behalf of my country because denying the asylum to Alan Garcia, I think this is a milestone in the fight against corruption and impunity. So, uh, said that, yes, the Fujimori and Montesinos case was a very relevant expression of what Naomi just said and what Sarah Chase in these days called uh, systemic operational uh, uh, scheme and operational system. 
And in the case of Fujimori and Montesinos, we were not dealing only with corruption. And I think in these days, we need to understand that corruption is not only bribing. Corruption is much more than that. Uh, when we talk about a system, we are talking about networks that are intertwined between business sector, high-level officials, uh, organized crime, judges. We have uh, a case now in Peru about that. Uh, so Fujimori and Montesino was a little bit of that. Not a little bit, it was a lot of that. But they also had a very strong phase of human rights violation. Because part of the scheme of Fujimori and Montesinos was uh, a group of Colina, the Colina group. And this, we originally thought it was a paramilitary group, then after the investigation we knew it was a military group. They were part of the army. And they were killing people, they were disappearing people, nine students and one professor from Cantuta University, they killed people in Barrio Altos, they abducted and killed some peasants in other places, they were torturing people. So Fujimori and Montesinos also had a strong phase of violation of human rights. And I think this brings together the notion that dictatorships and abuses of human rights are always linked to corruption. I think Pinochet was the last proof that there is no clean abuser of rights in the world. When the money of the Riggs Bank appeared, then we knew that it was confirmed that corruption and human rights get together. So what we did in our office uh, of the Procuraduría is to create a unit of human rights. So we brought Rora Gamarra, who you know, he was a very experienced fighter against abuses of human rights in uh, the Coordinador of Human Rights and then in EDLA. And we recruited him for our office and we opened an entire space to investigate human rights and corruption together. And it was very successful, I think. Uh, so, but on the other hand, we were also creating a new narrative about corruption because traditionally corruption has been seen only as a bribing process but then we realized that corruption is usually a victimless phenomenon. Nobody sees the faces of the people that are suffering because of corruption. And when a building collapses in Bangladesh and 1,600 women die, and then during the investigations, it is found that the building collapsed because someone paid in order to build that building where it was not appropriate and without the technical uh, requirements, those 1,600 women are direct victims of corruption. And when in Peru, uh, we saw some months ago two kids that died uh, in a container because they were locked there in order to work without getting out. And then we saw in a video how the supervisor of that office was bribed in order to look to another place. So those are victims direct of corruption. And when Fujimori and Montesinos were taking dozens of millions of dollars from the Peruvian budget that had an impact in the health system, in the educational system, and that had thousands, if not millions, of victims of corruption that were denied in their human rights. So uh, the Procuraduría also tried, through our press conference and, and our reports, to express a new narrative to show the faces of the victims of human rights uh, as a consequence of the corrupt practices of these criminal networks. Jose, uh, let's go from Peru to Guatemala and Honduras with Jan. Jan, you have been part of the CICIG and MASIC, two ad hoc mechanisms promoted by the United Nations and the Organization of American States in Latin America to combat corruption and, and impunity. In what way were the corruption and human rights agendas part of these mechanisms? Do, do you think there are still possibilities for similar mechanisms in the next few years in the region? Second question is, of course, more complicated. Let me just address the first one. Um, what is not well known for many people that still for problem is uh, that the CISIC agreement is an authentic human rights agreement. It's based on Chapter 9 of the UN Carter, Article 55 56, um, that um, builds upon one of the three pillars of uh, cooperation between the United Nations and member states. And this is specifically 
uh, the um, way to observe and respect human rights. This is the basis of this agreement that CISIC has. And how does this materialize? It materializes in the, in the formula of uh, clandestine security state apparatus that are the objective that this commission tackles with. Where does this come from? From the global um, agreement uh, that was signed in 1994 between the guerrilla and the government in order to set a basis for the negotiations and to look beyond the signing of the peace agreements into the risks that the transitional society could have. And they identified specifically these groups as being the most dangerous ones that would like uh, put uh, into danger the process. Um, once uh, they were identified, um, after uh, the Minugua, which is the mission of the United Nations, faced or was phasing out, there was a need to tackle with these groups that have merged then uh, already in 2000, 2001 to clandestine not only security uh, uh, groups, but to powerful economic uh, networks that were doing human rights violations in terms of uh, prosecuting and uh, uh, violating the uh, uh, rights of human rights defenders, but this within a huge economic network. So the first uh, part um, of CISIC was based on human rights, but the second then with a perspective on economic crimes that are linked to what Sarah Chase describes them uh, in her work on Honduras on an operating system of, I would say, not only corruption in a narrow sense, but in a broader sense. And this was then also the hypothesis for the Maxi Agreement that uh, we negotiated between uh, 2015 and 2016 with the Honduran government. The Honduran government wouldn't like to have included the human rights into this agreement because of uh, various details. I wouldn't go into the details now, but it includes the uh, democratic charter of the OAS. And it uh, includes in the preamble literally Article 4 for of the uh, human uh, of the uh, the Carter um, the, of the Democratic Carter of the OAS that is the link to the inter-American system of human rights. And if you go then to Article Three of the agreement, and you will see the reference to uh, what um, is the objective of this mission. The objective of the mission is not petty corruption; it is grand corruption, and it is that why you will find in Article Three several times mentioned network of corruption. And the networks of corruption are exactly what uh, then was uh, uh, analyzed by, by Sarah in her work, and it gives us a link to the human rights too, because structural corruption, according to now the resolutions of the inter-American system, is about human rights violations. Thank you, Inerte. Let's go to Claudio. Claudio, uh, as you know, this year, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights uh, issued the resolution 1 in 2018 on corruption and human rights, which represents a very important uh, advance in bringing together both agendas at the level of the Inter-American human rights system. What else can be done through the Inter-American human rights system? What about the OAS and its political bodies? Thanks, Katia. Uh, first of all, it's an uh, honor to be part of this panel today. Um, as you know, last uh, 15 years we have been talking about how the international movement on human rights and the international movement of anti-corruption can make some links in, in the world. Um, incredible, but, but it has been true that we have to make a work, to make visible uh, the way in which corruption impacts uh, human rights and how corruption uh, acts uh, make every day, as Naomi says, difficult the 
full implementation of uh, human rights. In that sense, I am agree with uh, Minister uh, Larraín that Lava Hato case shows us uh, the impact of corruption, not only in regional level, uh, but the impact of corruption in the rule of law, democracy, and human rights. Uh, I agree that this is not only a problem of money, a big money or a little one, it, it's a problem with our uh, democracies and the problem with uh, our human rights uh, situation in, in our countries. So in, in this context, I think that the resolution of the Inter-American Commission in March uh, of this year is a turning point. point. Why? Because it's clear, the, the resolution clearly established the link that the false fight against corruption is, relevant, is a relevant element for the enforcement of human rights in the region. Uh, what's next? Uh, I think that the first step in this new period could be uh, how the visibilization of the phenomena of corrupt, corruption could impact in the cases, uh, individual cases, mechanisms in the in the in the inter-American system. For example, uh, for for example, this could be very interesting to consider corruption as uh, an element to don't. Uh, be necessary the exertion, exertion of uh, preliminary work in, in the national level. Uh, other other uh, could be uh, in the persaltum process to consider that corruption could make 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 some preference so in some cases to uh, knowledge of the uh, commission. And, and the more important aspect that I think that could have the linkage between corruption and the protection of human rights in, in, in our, in, in our inter-American bodies could be uh, reparations. If you, if you make a clear link between the context of uh, corruption and the human rights violations, you could you could order uh, as commission or as uh, inter-American court more precise uh, reparation measures in uh, in different cases. You have an, an excellent example in the recent case of Ramirez uh, versus uh, Guatemala, where was a uh, case about. Uh, illegal adoptions in a context of corruption. Um, likewise, in the, it, it's a good news that the Commission is preparing a thematic report on this issue on uh, human rights and corruption. It's uh, another mechanism that could be used. And I think that the, tomorrow you will have an excellent um, dialogue with the Commission Minister uh, because the Commission is thinking about uh, a reporter on human rights and corruption. Maybe it's not a new mechanism as you are thinking, in, but could be an excellent first step. And, and the Commission needs the support of uh, a state to, to make this. And, and Chile could have a leadership uh, on this issue with, with other states. Uh, in short, uh, Katya, I think that uh, what we are doing now in, in the region is to take in a big corruption fight and human rights fight uh, seriously, first time in, in this period. Thank you. Perfect, yeah, thanks, thanks Claudio. Um, just, I'm going to stay on this theme of, of international mechanisms and, and turn um, back to Naomi. Um, I mean, you wrote a book called The Pinochet Effect, um, which uh, discusses the kind of cascading human rights prosecutions that began uh, with the arrest of General Pinochet in London in 1998. But one of the themes of your book is the role that 
international institutions from the creation of the, the ICC, the Rome Statute, to the jurisprudence that was emerging from the International Court at the time, the role that they played in sort of in dialogue with what was happening domestically in, in many countries uh, in this region um, in, in kind of pushing forward this, this, uh, this cascade of, of prosecutions. I wonder if you were to write a, write a, a, a sequel called The Odebrecht Effect. Um, <laughs> What, what would you say about the, the role of international law, of international institutions in this context? I think we heard from Minister Bahrain suggest that actually, when it comes to the anti-corruption fight, that there's been more done domestically, and where we've really seen you know, uh, institutions fall short, it's often been at the international level. There hasn't been as much kind of reinforcement from, uh, from supranational institutions. Do you share that, that feeling, and how would you, how would you characterize, say, the, the the anti-corruption treaty mechanisms, the, the work of the multilateral development banks, the, the different kinds of, of institutions that, that exist supranationally that are supposed to be uh, kind of reinforcing the domestic anti-corruption. Yeah, I think I think there is I think there is an order effect, um, and I think it's about bringing attention to this issue which doesn't just affect Latin America. I mean, there are similar conversations going on in other parts of the world about similar kinds of brand corruption. Um, I think there's been some work to expand thinking beyond bribery. I mean, I think the, the initial international response was things like the OECD conventions, uh, the FCPA in the US, uh, but very narrowly focused on bribery. And I think one of the things that's happened is an idea that, well, no, this is, you have to look at this in a much broader sense. Um, I think part of it's been the vis visualization that there are actual victims here, um, that this is not a victimless crime, that this is not a crime that affects the national treasury, that really, you know, not such a big deal. Um, and I think that's one of the things that this last set of uh, discussions has brought to the floor, is that there really are um, victims here, and you can put names and faces to them. Now, um, the, let me say a couple things. The anti-corruption conventions, my, I, I see them as very soft. I, I don't see them as having a lot of, uh, teeth to them. I mean, they basically tell the states, go do X, Y, Z. Right? But there's no real, there's a peer review mechanism, but the peer review mechanism looks at, okay, so did you create a law? But it doesn't necessarily look at, well, how is that actually being carried out? Who's doing it? How, you know, what have you done with it? Who have you gone after? Have you gotten at these networks um, that are encrusted in the state, or are you sort of playing around the edges? So I think there's a lot of work to be done with the anti-corruption conventions. One of the things we were talking about is, could you use some of the thoughts that come out of years of experience in the human rights conventions, for example, the idea that states have a responsibility to ensure rights and to protect rights, to take positive action, to say uh, the uh, anti-corruption conventions need to import that idea and start looking not just at law, but looking at a wide range of control institutions and figuring out um, how are those um, being used, are they captured, could, you know, is there a way to strengthen them so that you look at things, um, you know, beyond just, um, you know, sort of the, the language of the law, but you look at what are the implementing institutions and how are those working. Let me say a, a, bit, a bit about international financial institutions because, you know, on the one hand, international financial institutions for many years have had these compliance programs and you know, sort of all of these efforts, there's the blacklist, right? You know, so if, if you um, if you steal from the World Bank, you get on a blacklist and you can't do it again for a number of years. Um, but at the same time, the way the bank is evolving, and, and I guess 
all of that are evolving their mechanisms are making them less and less transparent. So that, for instance, you create systems of environmental and social uh, safeguards, but then you create a set of uh, country strategies, public-private partnerships, uh, country funds that are not subject to any of those mechanisms. And so it's a, it's a bit contradictory. Right? So on the one hand, you have the full compliance set of mechanisms, but on the other hand, you've got an evolving set of financial mechanisms that are less and less transparent. And that are more and more uh, focused on areas of the economy that tend to be highly correction prone, like infrastructure. So I think there's some work to be done there too. And one of the things that I think would be useful would be, you know, in, in sort of the risk of expanding this conversation too far, but I think that there is a need to dialogue with the international financial institutions and with the organizations of civil society that have been watchdogging those institutions for 25 years now. Perfect, thanks, Naomi. Um, Jose, we've covered uh, the American system, we've now covered the IFES. Um, let me ask you about something that you, I've heard you discuss in the past, which is the International Criminal Court. Um, you've talked about ways in which corruption might be uh, included as either a mitigating factor or somehow integrated into the uh, consideration of cases that come before the, the ICC. Uh, could you speak practically how to, to how, uh, in the international criminal law context, corruption might be uh, might be taken into account? Well, this is a discussion that started in Transparency International, I would say, like eight to ten years ago, and it was a difficult one because there was a group that was strongly advocating in order to, to make a campaign to include grant corruption as a, a, a crime of Article 7 of the Rome Statute. And there was another group, basically lawyers, saying this is impossible. Uh, there is no possibility, so we were discussing at the same time if there was a difference between grant corruption and regular corruption. Mm -hmm. Because we were observing a phenomenon like uh, 15 years ago or two decades ago, you can come with the fingers of one hand those cases that now we can call grand corruption. There was Suharto in Indonesia, Marcos in Philippines, uh, Nigeria with Abacha, Ujimori, I would say, in the last times. But now you open the newspapers or you put on the TV and you'll find these cases every day. I mean, you have, <clears throat> we opened a contest in Transparency International three years ago. We call it Unmasked Corrupt. So you can propose your candidates through internet so we can vote for who is the most corrupt in the world. We have 350 candidates. Uh, like 50 million people went into there to look uh, on this process. And Yanukovych one. Yanukovych, $12 billion were taken from Ukraine. Now he's in Moscow, protected by Putin. But then we had Ben Ali. We had uh, Mubarak in Egypt, 50 million. Recently, the Pujol family in Spain, it's about 3 billion euros. Here in the region, we have Martinelli in Panama. And uh, you know, there are 14 presidents that are in prison. Are, they flew away or are investigated for corruption crimes linked to Lava Jato. Lava Jato had, in fact, in 11 countries. And the prosecutors of Brazil believe that the Lava Jato scheme could rise up to 50 billion. So we're talking about a different phenomenon. That was our proposition when we started this debate in Transparency International. I'm glad now that we can easily talk about grand corruption. This was not a concept that was on the table uh, 10 years ago. And when we talk of grand corruption in TI, TI has worked on this definition. We are basically talking about a phenomenon that has three basic features. It's, it's committed by people with considerable power, political, or economical power, so it could be private corruption or public corruption, the FIFA case, for example, recently Nissan or, or Volkswagen, uh, the past Siemens. The second element of grand corruption is the immense amount of resources that are mobilized by these offers. We're talking about of hundreds of millions or thousands of millions uh, of, there's more to there is much more money on the table, it is also true. And the third, and for me the most relevant element of grand corruption that makes the difference with the other type of corruptions is the impact in human rights. Because this type of corruption kills people. 
They deny health. They deny education. They are affecting the daily lives of the poorest of the poor. That's why we believe that corruption is, is a tax that is paid by the poorest of our society. So once we were convinced that we should work on grand corruption as a priority, this was not, of course, uh, of consensus in our organization, but we decided to prioritize our work in grand corruption. Of course, the chapters had the freedom to do what they think is the best strategy in, in the country. But we, we put a push on grand corruption. And then we have the issue of the International Criminal Court. Uh, we studied the phenomenon. We retain a consultant. We work with a consultant. And the consultant said, it will take too much time and effort to try to, to change the wrong statute now and introduce grand corruption as a crime for the ICC. Uh, we explored universal jurisdiction, those issues we've been discussing now in DPLF in these days with the experts on these matters. And finally, we decided that we should try not making big reforms of the wrong statute, but try to introduce grand corruption as a criteria for admissibility of cases and or as an aggravating factor for those crimes against humanity. Because if you see the cases that are before the ICC, BEMBA, Kenya, and others, almost all of them, if not all of them, have a significant component of grand corruption. So uh, we had a meeting with uh, the prosecutor of the court. We discussed these issues with her. She was very sympathetic to start exploring this, and we put, a joint, we put in place a joint uh, team to work on this. And, and I think this is work in progress. Now that we have the Venezuelan case in front of the court, and we are just exploring to see if it would be ad uh, admitted as a case for, for the court, we believe, because in the case of Venezuela, it's just so visible the consequences of corruption for millions of Venezuelans that are invading our countries, push out, because they are dying in their place. So I think that we will see in the near future the International Criminal Court opening, I hope so, there are some other experts here that can give uh, more accurate information on this, but I think that the International Criminal Court and the Office of the Prosecutor will start considering this linkage between corruption and human rights and see how they can include corruption as an element to be analyzed in the context of a case tried before the International Criminal Court, as it is happening in the regional system. We've seen, as the minister said, now there are resolutions and uh, probably we'll have a hearing in the next uh, period of sessions of, of the Inter-American Commission to discuss the issue of corruption and human rights. And we hope to see soon one case of corruption processed from a human rights perspective in the Inter-American system uh, 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 against uh, violations of human rights. Perfect, thank you, Jose. I think I... In asking you the question, I think I suggested that corruption would be a, a mitigating factor. Obviously, what I meant to say was <laughs> an aggregating factor, not, not something that would lead, uh, lead sentences to be reduced. Um, Jean, let me turn to you. Um, clearly, I think it's fair to say uh, the human rights community is, is awake to the impact of, of corruption on, on human rights, and, and the, the resolution by the American Commission is, is I think, a good uh, Good example of that, the discussions about a potential rapporteurship are a reflection of that. The, the forthcoming report that the Commission uh, is preparing is another. Um, and, and certainly in the case of Transparency International, as you've heard from Jose, um, human rights is, is, a, is a component. The, the, the way in which they define grand corruption links back to the impact on human rights. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's also the case, uh, at least it's my sense, that the perhaps the the anti-corruption mechanisms have not integrated a human rights perspective as enthusiastically or as, or as aggressively as, say, the human rights mechanisms have a focus on, on corruption. And I wonder if I could just test that proposition with you, uh, specifically in the cases of, of CICIG and MASI, some of the um, the ad hoc uh, hybrid mechanisms that you've, you've worked with, to what extent um, is a human rights uh, approach to corruption present in, in the work that you've seen um, from those those bodies or more broadly? Um, 
call it, in, um, begin not with Sissing and Maxi, but with some facts in the region. One fact in the region is that all countries in Latin America have ratified both the regional and the universal convention against human rights. Second fact, all um, are part of the human rights system. And that's why you have a basis uh, that is common to all countries. <laughs> From a doctrinal point of view in public international law, there is a rule in the Vienna Convention on the Treaties, Article 31, um, that gives you a basis in order that both systems communicate when it comes to interpret obligations under international law. This is why um, I'm pretty surprised, maybe not that so much, uh, that um, the bodies that are implementing all well, overview, the interview, uh, the, the, the implementation of the universal and the regional conventions on corruption don't look at the obligations as a contextual element in order to analyze as to what extent uh, they have an impact on the interpretation of these laws. And to be very concrete, Article 35 of the Merida Convention, uh, which established an uh, obligation to provide mechanisms for uh, damage to victims in a procedural way that uh, could be one of the candidates for this. And now let me go to Sisik and Maxi. Uh, Sisik and Maxi, um, Sisik, uh, from the beginning, uh, having built up on the framework on human rights had, uh, had of course, uh, a perspective on corruption cases that would have an impact on human rights. And one of the, 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 the most uh, important cases is the one of the uh, Social Security case, Social Security Institute of Guatemala. The same happens, of course, to the Social Security Institute fraud, uh, a, a massive embezzlement in Honduras too. So these are two cases uh, where it becomes very evident that both missions uh, had um, a, a perspective on this, and not only had a perspective on this, but this was the very course why uh, Maxi uh, um, was put on the place uh, and, and on the table uh, as a negotiation, uh, as a mission that should be set up between the OAS and the Honduran government, uh, because this was a scandal that triggered uh, the, the, the manifestations of the street. Yeah? So there's always, and there has always been a perspective on both. Perfect, thanks. Um, I'll tell you, the uh, final question to you, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for, for questions uh, from the audience. But, um, you know, we've seen in recent years uh, massive mobilizations around, around corruption uh, in Latin America, reminiscent of what we saw on democracy and human rights uh, in decades past during the, uh, the transition period. Um, and we, I've heard it said that you know, corruption is the hum new human rights, that uh, in terms of what's driving citizen sentiment, citizen demands, that corruption is really the thing that, that brings people onto the streets. And going back to, to one of the things I think you, you said in your first intervention, um, it, it, do you agree with that? I think would be the first question. And, and if you do, what are the what are the implications, um, sort of practically, strategically uh, speaking, um, for the human rights movement? And does it uh, does it augur in favor of a, of a better kind of linkage uh, between the, the human rights campaigners and the anti corruption campaigners? It's interesting. Trying to understand what's happening today in the, in the region. And issue. Um, the thing, it, it, I think there's it's a common element between uh, anti-corruption movement and human rights movement. Uh, th this common element is to fight against abuses of power of, in, 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 this in different kinds of expression of this, of this power. Uh, grand corruption, as I said, uh, has 
escandalize and outreach the population in, in Latin America. Yeah. Maybe March today could say something like Fantasma recorre Europa el Fantasma de la Indignación sería. We have uh, an outreach in different mm -hmm. countries and uh, maybe uh, again a, a, a good uh, expression of this is in Argentina, que se vayan todos. Uh, and, and this is uh, dangerous, and, and, and this approach could, be, could end very badly if, if, you don't, um, if you don't make some sense, uh, you, you, if you don't uh, conduct uh, the social outreach, the manifestations, with some objective, uh, this could be only a fight in the street, but with this you can build uh, nothing different uh, for the long, in, in the long term. Uh, if, if the discussion is only about outreach, uh, you can end very badly like uh, the process in, in Brazil. Uh, the corruption of PT uh, made possible that Bolsonaro was elected. It, this is a, a very dangerous message with, for all our region. So um, I think that uh, precisely the connection between uh, human rights and uh, fighting against corruption uh, is important in this point. Uh, the fight against corruption uh, could be more constructive uh, or, or you can build something different if the human rights movement can uh, give some elements of uh, what is possible and what could we do in, in the future to make change in politics, economic, and social with some limits. Not everything is possible and not every change is, is, is a good change. So I, I think that uh, the movement of uh, outreach in, in, in the region uh, with uh, grand corruption, uh, cases, uh, it's necessary to make it or transform it in a movement of contraction of, of build and uh, democracies based on, on human rights. We will return to the debate of the 90s or the Thank you. Um, so we're about at time, but I know we have a lot of folks here with uh, um, a lot of knowledge and, and I'm sure strong strong opinions about these issues. So I want to at least take one uh, round of questions. Maybe we'll do three uh, and then come to our back to our panel. And I'm sure uh, they'll stick around for a little while. People want to chat them up after the event. So let's see a couple. Let's just do these three over here. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and, and keep it succinct, please. Uh, two very simple questions. How would you assess the role? of bilateral donors in uh, these areas. Uh, and two, is there a role for bilateral donors in the future? I'm thinking specifically of Spain, uh, Germany, and the United States. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically of programs for the rule of law and in transparency in government. I should also add that one of the finest achievements uh, uh, with regards to AID was spearheaded by Ambassador Michael during the 90s. Uh, and uh, uh, I was intrigued by his question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Julie, Michael, and Ambassador Michael. Congressional Research Service. So I want to push a little more, Michael, what you were doing, which was the regional watchdog. As it has to do. Um, so we've heard about involving political actors, politicians, but what about creating a new body? I mean, I think this, or some new body within OAS, I think it's really problematic. 
I mean, you have to get consensus on delegating sovereignty. It's going to have teeth. Uh, it's not really enthusiasm necessarily in this kind of era of nationalism that people want to delegate more sovereignty, at least across the region. And then also the carcasses of all the regional bodies. For example, Alba, Selak, Unasur, But anyway, what, what can be done that's practical that can really move in this direction? Thank you. I think my question actually follows up great with this. I'm Eduardo Calderon, a human rights attorney. And my question is how important or necessary, uh, in your opinion, is to have this sort of toothless conventions or, or mechanisms uh, when we have cases such as the one that was referred to, Ramirez versus Guatemala, where there was clear linkage between corruption and illegal adoptions. So the question is, should we follow that path? Would that be better? Thank you. So that I don't discriminate entirely against the side of the room. I think there was a hand in the back. Let's go there for the last question. Um, hi, uh, my name is Felicia. I'm a consultant for Latin America, based here in Washington, D.C. And I got a question by one of my clients. It's just talking to what you were saying, the element of abusive powers, which is talking about corruption, in which in many cases you have not only the population being affected, but also you have they have penetrated the private sector and the public sector. It's like a big puzzle. And then the middleman is a trap. It's a trap, the small businesses. And they're being sometimes dried up, punched, and pushed away by big corporations that are corrupted already and are also like the case of Odebrecht. And then you have the situation that this middleman, who are sometimes can be a franchise, for example, know about these big private corporations that are corrupted and falsifying, for example, um, how you say, parts of, of cars or things like that, and selling it to the country, which is a violation to human rights. How can you denounce that? Is there a mechanism? Is there like a simple way so you don't have to go to a grand court? And that they, this can be accessed, you know, as you have a ministerio publico um, for corruptions in some countries that they have created just for a simple person. Is there a way for entrepreneurs, for franchisees, for just a regular business person to go and denounce this? Because these people are being impacted, and what is happening is that the, the funds are being dried out. And they're like, sometimes they ask us, like, we don't know what to do. Should we just go public about it? But it's just happening. And what happens is when they try to denounce it, some of these companies, what they do is they just go to governments where there's no democracy. And we, know, we know in Latin America which governments could be like that, for example, in Venezuela, or other countries in the Caribbean. So what is a way that these people can access to get their voices heard, uh, not only in the international courts, but maybe in the business way. Because as you can see the case of Odebrecht, if there would have been a way, maybe this would have been denounced. Right. Right, thank you. Perfect. So um, maybe we'll just start with W, and we'll, we'll come down to how this way you can answer any or all of those questions. Yes. First, um, the um, mechanism. Uh, I, I think that this uh, it's an important debate for, for us. Uh, maybe we, we could sing, and I agree with the minister, that the ideal could be a, a, a new kind of mechanism, uh, uh, effective mechanism in the region. But I, I, I know what you're saying. It's true that it's so difficult, it, the, the bureaucracy of, of the OAS uh, and any, any other uh, organization of the is, is difficult to think in a, in, 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 to make it be a, 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 a mechanism like you, Mr. are, are, are thinking. Uh, so m my view is that uh, we could use the mechanism that today we have in uh, in, in, region, in our region, and uh, especially the work that could be made by the Inter-American Commission uh, of Human Rights. It's, uh, I, I think that we, we can make an opportunity to the Inter-American Commission to work on this issue uh, seriously with uh, the necessary fund and with the political support. If this work, uh, I, I think that could be an excellent deal. If it doesn't work, maybe we could 
uh, try to work in, 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 in other way, in other way uh, or, or mechanism. Um, you, you, your question is, is so difficult because uh, here we, we have a really a, a problem because um, in, in our system, the, the state is the, uh, all, all of the duties on human rights are for the state and not the private sector. So uh, we need the state to, to do uh, or to make some way to uh, make a possible the criminal prosecution of uh, private sector in this. Until we are trying to make something like this with a, a new legislation uh, to criminal uh, responsibility of companies. Maybe this could be a way a criminal, uh, it's not only the best way to uh, do, to, to fight corruption in grand scale, maybe only the big fish. Clear say you, in this case, yeah. But you, you can work, work against corruption in any level by criminal law. It's not the way. So maybe we could uh, think about a, a, a better system than criminal law to fight against corruption. But really, I, I think we have to answer it. Could be this way. Um, I think this is going to take a lot of different things going on at the same time. I don't think there's a magic number here. I don't think there's a single institution regionally or nationally that's going to work. It's going to be working at all these different levels, um, including not only the national, but the subnational. Not, um, we haven't said anything about that, but I think that there are, are ways in which we need to think from bottom about these things. Um, I think one thing that is starting to happen that may be useful uh, is a sort of coordination among prosecutors and anti-corruption um, agencies on a national level, but, but working in a sort of counter network right, to, the net, to the transnational networks of corruption that we're seeing. Uh, and that that may be one way to advance. Um, I wanted to say something about bilateral donors. Um, there is a need to do some of the work that is incipient in the IFIs, but is less than incipient in bilateral donors. There's not even the kind of minimal uh, controls over effects on people, not so much uh, stealing, per se, right? There, there are, generally speaking, uh, mechanisms for catching fraud in bilateral re in, in donor relationships, but not so much when the dam displaces 100,000 people, not so much when the forestry project turns out to facilitate illegal forestry. Uh, those mechanisms need to be put in place. Uh, there's an opportunity now in the U.S. with the creation of a new internet, a new uh, U.S. investment mechanism to try to do that from the very beginning and to get it right. I think uh, there is a basic agreement that corruption needs some uh, control beyond the national systems. Uh, and that's why more and more international institutions are working on these issues. Now the World Bank has an integrity unit that the IADB, the OECD is strongly working in the uh, convention against uh, transnational bribery. And on the regional side, I think that the Mississippi, unfortunately, is a very little productive mechanism. I don't see anything that has come from the Mississippi that we can say, wow, this is really working helping to improve the fight against corruption. So uh, we've been advocating, we have started advocating in, in the past year in order to think of creating a special reporter like we have in the region for freedom of speech and for economical, cultural, social 
rights and environmental issues, specifically on corruption. And we discussed this on the summit, the preparation of the summit of Lima. But when we approach, and we are absolutely conscious of the weakness of the OASs, the OAS. Yeah. There are, there's a lot of lack of resources. They don't have enough personal. And when we approach the OAS to talk about this, they always say, no, this is too much problem for us. We don't have money. Uh, maybe we can uh, introduce corruption into the agenda of a reporter for film and speech. That would be a disaster, in my opinion. We would get it out of focus. So we need to convince the governments. And uh, in the context of the Inter-American Commission, I think a reporter that would help to monitor, assess, discuss with the governments, propose things in the way that Minister uh, Larain was mentioning could be a valuable effort to do. And we would really appreciate if governments like yours and probably ours in Peru would move this on the agenda of the OAS. Let's try to have a special reporter. It's not a big deal. And, and it has proven to be a very effective mechanism in the context of the OAS. Uh, on business, uh, I have to say that my experience is that the, the business sector, basically the big companies have been more part of the problem than part of the solution. And uh, speech has always been a speech from the victim side, saying we are victims of extortion and we know that they had enough power, enough resources, enough technology to push back on this. When we saw Montesinos sitting with the most powerful entrepreneur of Peru, bargaining uh, the taxes of his products and in order for him not to make problems to Montesinos, we understood that the business sector, the big ones at least, were not interested in fighting corruption. They went through the easy path, arranging things. And now they are paying a bill. Lava Jato, we've seen for the first time, emblematic entrepreneurs go to prison, their companies are at the risk of going into chapter 11, the chain of uh, suppliers, in the case of Peru, 450 companies already broken, I mean, it's, it's a real mess. So I think this is a great opportunity, and we are trying to do that from, from the regional chapters of Transparency International to try to open a new discussion with the business sector and see how can we together uh, built a new model for doing business in Latin America with integrity. We have a huge challenge here because there's an immense lack of confidence, of trust between the private sector and NGOs. They think we have an ideological agenda and uh, on the uh, NGO side, many times we've seen the entrepreneurs are, are part of the corruption uh, hardcore sector. So we have to build trust and try to, to move this on. Uh, uh, fortunately, we have found some new leaders on the business sector and we're starting to work on them. I would just like to add on the obtuseness of uh, international treaties and uh, bodies uh, that uh, look at the implementation. The best uh, way to make things being implemented is broadening the scope of uh, those who can enforce them. And once you have a human rights perspective, you get objective state obligations into subjective rights of people. And once you have subjective rights of people, you can litigate them. Um, this is, I think, one of the most uh, um, effective mechanisms. Uh, pick up a uh, resolution uh, from the Human Rights Commission from 2017-2018, where positive state obligation is being uh, like ratified and litigated uh, with a view of state obligations that you might have under the anti-corruption conventions, like for example in terms of damages, when there is no procedure in place. Yes, for example, I think this could be much more effective than creating uh, watchdogs uh, 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 and, and just another uh, public body uh, that would supervise the supervisor who is supervising the supervisor. Yeah? So it is about the victim uh, that has to be empowered and litigate what is uh, being produced and pronounced by the human rights bodies uh, with a view on the anti-corruption.
This has been a, a terrific discussion. I want to thank all our panelists. Thank again, uh, Minister Larain. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn to Katia for the last word. Uh, Katia, it's great partnering with PPLF on this. And uh, final word over to Thank you, Michael. I just want to say thank you to all of you to stay here uh, today. Uh, just to say that uh, for me on this topic, we need to think out of the box. Of course, I agree with June that we, need, we don't need toothless bodies. We need to think creatively. Uh, we need to explore what we already have, the mechanisms that we already have. The Inter-American Commission is going, of human rights, is going to produce a report on corruption and human rights next year. We, we, we have to help this report to be useful. We need to support it. And we need to think, again, out of the box about this, I mean, a new mechanism, which shouldn't be really a big deal, as Jose said. A rapporteur for corruption and human rights is something possible. Uh, Luis Almagro, the uh, Secretary General of the OAS, created last year an special advisor for crimes against humanity. Why don't think about an special advisor about corruption and, and human rights? Just ideas and just thinking out of the box. Thank you very much again for being here.